excited to be with you and to talk uh, about a topic that's near and dear to me. Why are we still talking about data-informed instruction? And I want to talk with you about this from a research perspective. And I have to explain that I get a bad rap among uh, a lot of my colleagues because I talk so much about research. And I think I need to explain that when I go to the doctor, I don't want the doctor telling me that he's prescribing something based on his hunch or her hunch. I want to know that what they're prescribing, the actions that they're taking are based not on years of practice, um, but on good quality research. And I feel the same way about the precious children in our classrooms. We want to make sure that we're supporting them with the best information we have so that we can maximize their success as learners and their lifelong success. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a side story. I just want to explain the context for uh, the focus on data and a few other things that are, are related to that. And we'll talk about effective principles, about quality instructional materials, unfinished learning, and the use of data in the classroom and beyond. And hopefully you'll chat as we go along, you'll make comments, you'll ask questions, and certainly at the end, we'll take some time for some questions too. So the side story begins with my work and my colleagues' work at Sadlier. At Sadlier, we partner with Catholic schools and parishes, and we have wonderful relationships. So Danny McElhaney, for instance, who is uh, the leader for our sales team, uh, our senior vice president for sales, is someone who has a great listening ear. And our managers and our product development specialists all listen exceptionally well and our partners trust us. And so we heard a lot over the last year about particular needs, pressing needs that Catholic school leaders felt that they had. And I think that sadly or prides itself on being a good listener. And so we listened and what we heard really drove us to action. We felt we were being called to respond to what was shared by superintendents, by principals, by assistant principals, by teachers and by families. And as we acted, we developed a product full access that we firmly believe responds to the particular areas of concern that were voiced. And I'm not going to talk about full access today. I want to talk to you about the research behind full access and really the research that helps us understand why these leaders were making the requests that they were making, particularly the, the requests that superintendents and principals voiced to us. And so as we talk about that, I'm going to be talking about what drove the requests that we heard. And I'm going to start by talking about why it was focused on data. Um, you'll see lots of other things incorporated in the conversation, but it's really the, the data aspect that's important for our conversation today. I think the first thing that drove the request was that principals recognize how important their leadership role is and they know what contributes to their effectiveness and in turn, the success of the school. And we know from the research what makes an effective principal, what drives that school's success. And I thought it would be helpful if we looked at that together. I thought it would help us understand what 
drove the actions that we at sadly or took. The first thing that we have to, to acknowledge is that this is not new research. This is not something that we have just started talking about for decades. We've understood that the principal is critical in school success. The leadership of the principal is a major determinant in the success of the students, the success of the teachers, the engagement and support of the families um, and other stakeholders. And it's not as though um, this is just constrained to student achievement. Um, the impact of principals is seen in terms of all students and it goes well beyond academic success. It also has to do with student values, students' identity, teachers' um, feeling of belonging, lots of other things are impacted by principals who are effective principals. And there are some overlapping domains of skills that strong principals consistently demonstrate. The first is in the area of instruction, their ability to support teachers as they teach. And we could talk a lot about each of these various elements uh, due to our time constraints and because I want to focus more on data, I'm not going to be spending an inordinate amount of time on any of these particular elements. But it's important to recognize that principals really are key in helping teachers meet the needs of students and support students' academic success and, and overall life success. The second area where principals really make a difference is in terms of the development of all of the individuals involved in the school and building relationship skills. And the third area where principals really develop um, success and have a skill set that makes a difference is in terms of organization. And when we talk about these skills, we're talking about skills that go beyond uh, what we think of as sort of school-based skills. And these are, are more um, encompassing, all encompassing, including things like strategic thinking and problem solving and the use of data. So principles have those three domains of great strength and effective principles draw on that skill set to drive a successful school. Um, they use that skill set in their interactions with all of the stakeholders involved in the school and in their practices in the way that they monitor, support, provide resources, guide data analysis, et cetera. There are practices that are widely recognized as being associated with effective principles. And interestingly, from, from my perspective, data plays a role in all of these practices. The first practice is that principals who are highly successful focus their interactions instructionally and they work with teachers to improve their instructional practice in three dimensions. The first is that they really are able to determine teachers' effectiveness and leverage the teachers who are highly successful uh, and their skill set to support students who need that support most and also to develop a community of learners and have an impact on other teachers. And it includes not just recognizing what teachers' capacity is, but also giving them very explicit feedback and coaching them to improve their instruction. Uh, so it's not just walking through the classroom once a quarter, making some observations, and letting it go, but actually spending time being explicit about what went well, what needs improvement, and guiding 
um, the teacher to improve areas of focus. And effective principals use data to guide the instructional decisions that are made on behalf of the whole school. Uh, that includes where students are placed in terms of classrooms, that includes decisions about instructional materials, um, the overall instructional program, areas of focus for improvement, and establishing goals that are instructionally related and monitoring the progress of the school towards those goals. So with this first practice, instructionally focused interactions, you can see the role that data plays. As we look at the second practice, building a productive school climate, um, we are gonna see that impact again. But it's important to note that a school climate that is robust and supportive has lots of benefits. Teachers' instructional effectiveness improves in schools that have a good, strong professional climate. And students' test scores are much higher in schools where the climate has an academic focus. That's not just their test scores, their success overall academically um, and their behavior also are aligned to that focus and that type of climate. Um, it's the case that principals have a lot to do with climate and they start by helping teachers feel empowered to make decisions, uh, to use what they know about best practices and Principals have a major role in making students feel safe and valued and supported. And interestingly, um, that has a lot to do with principals' ability to use their social and emotional intelligence uh, in order to create an environment that supports students and teachers and families and helps them feel that they can rely on the trust um, of each other and believe in each other, uh, that they are able to collaborate effectively, uh, that they can use data to make decisions and have honest discussions about the data without fear of repercussions. And they can focus on continuous improvement together. So the school climate, has many dimensions and many elements, uh, data plays a role in supporting all of the stakeholders in being engaged um, and feeling that they're truly a part of the learning community and that there's transparency there. The third element is collaboration. And we certainly know that for our students, collaboration is an important skill um, it's a, a 21st century learning skill, but it's the case that collaboration plays a very important role in the school setting as the educators and others who touch students really work together to support students' success. Um, these things require planning, intentional collaboration. They are not some the kinds of results that happen just implicitly and by happenstance. And so what needs to take place is that principals have to arrange schedules and calendars. And I know in Catholic school settings how really challenging this is for principals, but they have to make time for common planning. They have to make sure that they have uh, professional learning communities that can meet consistently, that have the right resources um, in order to make decisions instructionally and focus on students. And so that collaboration isn't meeting in the, the lounge for a couple of minutes as you pass each other to pick up your lunches uh, or having a hallway conversation. These are intentional times together. Um, and we know that professional learning communities have very specific goals. Um, those professional learning communities, as they focus on those instructional goals, 
must engage in a cycle of continuous improvement that includes inquiry and data analysis and planning time and a structure for implementation, the ability to look at that implementation and reflect on it and determine if it's been successful, um, continue to use data to determine if the desired results have been attained. Um, so data is at the heart of the work of professional learning communities, and there has to be time to do that work collaboratively. And finally, it's important that what's being noticed in and observed and determined through the professional learning community process reflects in in-service, in professional development, in the resources that are provided to teachers and the opportunities that are given. The fourth practice is strategic management. Um, it is really important in the settings that we're in where resources are tight, uh, parents are, are contributing to um, the, the body of, of money that we have to, to use and to the human resources that are available that principals are using data um, and using their knowledge to allocate those resources to make sure that effective teaching and learning happens. And obviously in our context, people are the, the greatest resource that we have. And so that means that principals have to be very conscious of best practices, of what makes effective teachers as they hire teachers and then as they evaluate teachers. So that focus on, on data and evidence is again, very, very important. And because we know the impact that teachers have on student success, teachers make a tremendous difference in student outcomes. It's very critical that principals think about providing support for those lower achieving students and rather than assigning those students to teachers who have less experience, uh, making sure that the most effective teachers are supporting those students in their learning process. Uh, so you know that as a principal, uh, your teachers are your greatest resource and you certainly want to do everything in your power strategically to retain your best teachers to reduce turnover um, that is tightly correlated to the success of a principal. So we know that principals understand what it takes to be effective and they recognize that data is at the heart of their school success. And so that was one of the rationales for coming to Sadlier with the particular request um, that they came to us with the need for data, the need for assessment data that could be used in their schools. And certainly data alone is not sufficient, which is why I've shared um, the other elements of being an effective principal. But we know that that was one of the primary reasons for the ask. Another reason for principals making the ask of sadly, or for high quality assessments and then um, recommendations for resources, instructional resources that would help students get on track in terms of their learning was because they recognize that the quality of the instructional materials teachers use makes a difference. Um, it's very clear from the research that having access to quality materials is fundamental to strong student outcomes. It's not the only thing, and I'm not at all implying that, but it's very clear that students are going to be more successful when teachers have high quality materials at their fingertips. And the research over the last decade has been abundantly clear that when teachers are having to gather resources from various places, pull things off the internet, um, the outcomes are not as significant 
um, as they are if they have high quality materials. And in the long run, high quality materials are a better investment than focusing on things like reducing class size. They make a real difference in student achievement. So when teachers have those resources, they're better able to address concerns. And one of the reasons, of course, that we heard from um, the leaders in schools and, and the superintendents was that we were faced with the potential impact of COVID. And I want to be clear, of course, that makes the importance of instructional materials greater uh, because we know that there is some impact even though Catholic schools have not been closed in the same way that public schools have. Uh, it's just the case that having those high quality materials will make a big difference for student outcomes and knowing which resources to use to address instructional needs. So the third area then that drove the ask that, that those leaders made was around this issue of COVID and unfinished learning. And it's very clear from the data that across the United States, unfinished learning um, has increased due to COVID. Certainly, we know that Catholic schools have been in session, um, that students have been in the classroom at a much higher rate than in public schools. But it is very difficult to determine the impact that the social and emotional distress of the other reduction in social interaction, extracurricular activities, relationships with families and friends has had on students and student learning. Uh, and certainly it's challenging to mitigate that if we're not aware of it. So it is a good assumption that there's been some impact on almost every student in our classrooms and that we need to be aware of that even if um, the unfinished learning isn't quite what's depicted here as we look at that circumstance across the United States. Um, it's really important that we not operate on the hunch that we've done a great job. Uh, it's really important to use assessments to determine if there's any unfinished learning that needs to be addressed and that we double down in our efforts to address that unfinished learning with making sure that we're focusing where the needs are and that we have the right resources to address them. And I want to also be clear that we have unfinished learning in our classrooms all the time. Yes, it's true that Catholic schools have done a far better job than public schools and other schools in driving student success. But our NAEP scores certainly remind us that there's great opportunity for growth, um, particularly in core subjects like reading and math, and that students who fall into the general at-risk categories certainly need additional support. So children in, uh, from lower income backgrounds, children of color, um, if we look at the NAEP data for Catholic schools, certainly uh, are going to need additional supports to optimize their success. And so it's very important that teachers have assessment data that identifies areas of concern and that they have instructional recommendations that they can act upon. Uh, what the research shows um, is very interesting. We know that data is important. Uh, we need data to understand individual student needs but that isn't sufficient. Too frequently what happens is that we assess students, we analyze the data so that we know where there are learning needs. And then there's a 
a, a, a halt because it is challenging both from a time perspective and a resource perspective, but also a deep knowledge perspective to match the next instructional steps with those particular areas of need. So it is really important for teachers that they not only have that assessment data, but they also are given support for clearly understanding what would be the next instructional step that they should take and what resources would best support their instruction as they take those steps. It's absolutely the case that that's more imperative when teachers have limited planning time. Um, and we know that we want students to be successful at grade level work. So making sure that we support um, reducing the amount of unfinished learning and getting students on track is really particularly important and giving teachers the right support for that is really very, very powerful. So we've talked about several areas that have driven the ask. Certainly effective principals know that they need data. Uh, they know that that makes a difference in their success in supporting teachers and stakeholders, families, and um, the students in their school. We know that having access to high quality materials um, is something that's critically important and was recognized in the requests that came to us. And we know that it's really very important to, in this particular time frame, focus on identifying, identifying any areas of concern, but not lulling ourselves to sleep and thinking that the, this is an aberration in time and that when this year is finished, we're not going to have that same need. It is in fact the case that we should always, as we begin our school year, uh, assess students to determine where they are in the learning continuum and that we support students on accessing grade level material and being successful with that. Um, and it is also important that we recognize that there are students who may be above level and that we're monitoring those students' development and making sure that they grow. Uh, and that is you know, certainly imperative in every setting. So we have a diverse group of learners and we want to make sure that those students are supported. The final rationale for asking for uh, a particular set of resources was that these Catholic school leaders know the value of data in their settings. They know data empowers. They know that that data-informed cycle is the most powerful instructional model and it fuels continuous improvement. So when we as educators, as family members as stakeholders think about the students in our lives, it's really important that we have the right data in usable format in a timely manner so that we are able to make strong, sound instructional decisions and match those decisions to the resources and steps that we take, the action that we take, to make sure that students achieve at the highest possible levels. And in doing that, we have to move away from our negative feelings about assessment and our negative feelings about data. Um, we have for too long felt that testing uh, was the bane of our existence. And you know, it is true that testing or assessments can be inappropriately used, but used correctly in the right context through professional learning communities, uh, we can really make a difference for our students. So it's, 
it's not about using the data to evaluate teachers or as a tool for compliance. It's really about using that data to help us continue to uh, refine our practices and address student learning needs and support students in growing every year that they're in our classrooms. So as administrators, it is important that we make sure we have in place um, those things that will help everyone trust data um, and that we recognize our role in putting those things in place. It's very clear that having data on students' performance, uh, and there are all types of data, so we can think about attendance and social and emotional learning. I'm not talking just about um, academic data, although certainly that is, is a critical piece of this. Uh, but we need access to that. And it is not just a point in time. We need to be able to look across the year um, in order to drive imp improvement and, and really over time as a whole. And we want to think about it in terms of growth. So those high flyers are getting the support that they need. Um, and, and we are also supporting students who are striving students in that we are able to get a robust picture across a diocese, an archdiocese, and across the country. And we're really supporting um, our work. And we know that that's one of the values of, of NCEA is uh, giving us some of those data linkages so that we get the best possible pictures. Um, and we want to make sure that we are keeping data secure, um, that we're also using data to inform our families and our stakeholders. Um, and certainly it can become a great marketing tool for us. We want to use data to improve instruction and our practices as a school. And we want to make sure that we support teachers in knowing how to effectively use data, interpret data and make instructional decisions from it. We certainly want to use data uh, to, to, as a whole, make sure we're staying on track and meeting our goals. So those 10 things that um, we need to know make a big difference for the school and principals certainly are aware of that as they are trying to have access to different data types and provide support for teachers in using that data. So as a whole, we also uh, want to make sure that we're not leaving any students behind. Uh, we want to fo focus on every student in our school and as a team, uh, pay attention to the needs of those students. And when we have the right school culture and we use data appropriately, we're putting students at the center um, and we're using data to support their success. So again, we want to make sure that uh, we're using assessment data appropriately, that we don't overassess, but that we recognize the value of assessment and what it brings to the table for our schools, and that we use that assessment data along with lots of other data types to support our students um, and to make sure that the students who have the greatest needs are, are receiving the support that they need instructionally. It's helpful as administrators and educators to have four priorities as we work with data. And it's very clear that the leaders who came to us we're aware of these four priorities. Uh, and the first is that we wanna make sure that when we're assessing, we're assessing instructional elements that matter, um, aspects of achievement that matter. Um, and we want to make sure that we're assessing all students and monitoring their movement towards success. As I mentioned earlier, effective principals understand that we have to provide professional learning to help our 
teachers and other leaders know how to use data effectively. And we have to provide time uh, to analyze and, and take action on that data. And we have to have a climate of trust where our families understand the data that we're using and why we're using it. And they know the status of their students and they are confident that we treat that data uh, in a way that is respectful and protect its privacy. And that we are using that data in a timely way uh, rather than collecting it and then ignoring it for months before we take action on it. And that's, that's part of where uh, having something other than a paper pencil system makes a very big difference for us. I've been talking to you about the critical nature of data, and I'm talking to you about that because Catholic school leaders recognize its importance and are putting systems in place to ensure that they have the right data to make decisions for their schools and that teachers have the right data to inform their instruction. Um, and as a partner, it's really important to us that we support that work. It really can make a difference for each student in each school. Uh, we value supporting the success of every Catholic school student in the United States and elsewhere. And we don't want any students being lost along the way. So if we focus on effective use of data at every level, uh, together we'll be making sure that every student is as successful as they can possibly be. And we're going to see students excelling because as a community, uh, we are helping teachers and administrators make decisions that will result in students learning more effectively and having greater outcomes. We are blessed um, at Sadlier to be a partner and we are focused on strong student outcomes and certainly using research to make a difference. And I hope that this story has helped you reflect on a number of best practices and ways that uh, you as a leader can continue to make a difference for the teachers that you touch and the students that you work with, your colleagues, and those precious children in our classrooms. I am eager to hear from you to receive any questions that you might have um, and to continue the conversation once we leave uh, this setting. So I, I hope that we'll continue to communicate with each other and chat um, as we move forward. And I hope that uh, you are thinking about new ideas and new ways that uh, you can support student success and that you're sharing them with uh, the partners that you interact with. Thank you for, for joining me.